received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Thank you, Thank you, it's a beautiful day. I know it's a little cloudy outside, but it's beautiful to hear the voices, be able to see your faces, and be able to enjoy this opportunity to worship together. I hope that you have been uplifted already by the prayers and the songs the opportunity to commemorate the sacrifice of Jesus. It's great to see visitors today. We're thankful that you've come our way. It's also good to see some that have come back, and I know that there are quite a few who are back with us and hopefully for several months are going to be with us. And it's especially good to see Jack and Harley Nicholson after Jack's been undergoing treatment for several months up in Indiana. And Jack, we're glad that you're able to be here and uh, to be able to see you and worship. I heard about a teacher working with some young children and trying to teach them the idea of Jesus entering into the world. And this one little boy, after the teacher had given the lesson, she called upon him to say a prayer at the very end of class. And this is what the little boy said as he had understood the presentation of the lesson. He said, thank you, God, for Jesus, your only forgotten son. Jesus, your only forgotten son. And I'm afraid that in the world, that may be more true than we would like to admit. There is a forgetfulness about Jesus. That is what Jesus means and why Jesus has come into the world. Several years ago, there was a survey done in another country of teenagers. And they were asked about fulfilling or, or finishing this sentence. I think my life would have more meaning if... And then they were asked to complete that. 87% of those teenagers said that if they had the right job, a good job, that they would feel more fulfilled or have greater meaning in life. 85% said if they had marriage, the right spouse, that that would give them fulfillment and meaning in their life. Right behind that, 84% said that their life would be more meaningful with sports, and recreation. Way down the list at 15%, and obviously they gave multiple answers with these percentages, 15% said that their life would have greater meaning through Bible study and prayer. 80% in another part of this survey said that they thought that it was important whether Jesus actually existed, but 85% said it was unimportant whether or not Jesus was God's son. Now, if you think about what that survey kind of indicates, it tells us that a lot of people are living life on a completely different plane than about spiritual thought or a spiritual relationship with God. Have you ever had the experience that I have, you know, a package arrives and it's delivered and, and you don't know what's in it. You know, it's a gift, somebody has sent it, and so it all of a sudden has come whether it came through the Postal Service or uh, United Parcel or whether it's FedEx, you know, here all of a sudden you're holding the box, and so you go as soon as you can to get a utensil and try to open the box safely, okay, which is always a challenge if I have a knife in my hand, but, but understand, you try to open the box safely, you open it up, and the first thing you see are those little peanuts, you know, 
it like the styrofoam, you know, it's filled the box to protect whatever it is that's supposed to be precious inside. There's all these little stuffing or fillers that are inside this box, all right? Now, maybe you haven't done what I've done, but I thought, oh, great, I get to play with all these little peanuts. And I just started throwing them up in the air, you know, and, and, and then you kind of realize, well, wait a minute, there might be something else in the box. And so you dig in and you find the item, and of course, it brings you the satisfaction, the joy of knowing that someone thought of you and the particular item. And the more personal it is, the more joy maybe that you have for the fact that their relationship with you is being shared. Now, once you have gotten the desired item out of the box, what do you do with that box, with all that filler? Even if it's those plastic air-filled parts, you know, that just keep the package, keep the precious things from being broken or shattered, what do you do with the box? Here's what I do. I take that box with all the filling and I set it up on the mantle and I cherish that box, you know? That box becomes something very precious to me. Now, if, if I were telling you the truth, you would look at me and say, this guy's crazy. Some of you are already thinking that anyway. And some of you may be right, okay? Understand, the box was not the gift. And all of that filler was not the gift. Those things are not precious. In fact, you say, I want to make sure that gets out so it's gone as soon as the trash guy comes the next day or someday that week. You don't hold on to that box. That box is not what is precious. That filling in the box is not what you cherish, do you? Question. As we look around at the world, and we see people in it whose lives have been broken, whose lives are empty, whose lives have been shattered, maybe by failed promises and broken relationships and the hurt and the frustration and the difficulties that come because life has its challenge. This journey that we call life is not smooth sailing. It is not always H.G. Wells said this, I have no peace. All life is at the end of the tether. Does that sound like he was at the end of his rope? Yes. Henry David Thoreau, the poet, said most men live lives of quiet desperation. The philosopher Blaise Pascal said in describing the human heart that it was an infinite abyss. Does that sound like to you that there are people who are looking for something to give them meaning, something in which to find significance, some search for the very heart of what life is all about. Maybe you remember that as the Bible opens, the story begins, and God creates everything. He creates two people, Adam and Eve. And there they are in the Garden of Eden. And God enjoys a relationship with them. They are, as it were, able to walk and talk with God. And then, based upon the one single solitary prohibition that God had given, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all of a sudden, as soon as they have violated or transgressed that one commandment that God had given, all of a sudden, everything is turned upside down. When God comes looking for Adam, Adam does what? Because of the, the burden of his guilt, he hides. Whereas before, they had enjoyed this relationship with God, open, wonderful, personal. Now all of a sudden, Adam and Eve find themselves trying to make themselves a covering of fig leaves. They find themselves trying to hide because they are ashamed. They recognize that they have fallen short of the glory of God, that they are no longer right in his sight. They are unrighteous. And because of sin, an emptiness comes, but it is an emptiness that is filled with fleas, running away from God. They want to hide. They want to find something in which to cover up, and they won't have to look at God standpoint of their sin. If you think about the way in which that story unfolds, I believe 
that what we see, in fact, in the world today, and in many people's lives, most people's lives, possibly even in your life, is we see people who are empty, people who are broken, people who have not found the fullness that God would have them to enjoy, and they struggle. That emptiness leaves them wandering, lost, hopeless, and helpless. Jesus, in John chapter 4, came across a woman. She had come to this well there, Jacob's well, near Samaria, and she was coming to get water. And Jesus, even though he was a man and he was a Jew, initiated a conversation with this woman at the well. He asked her to give him a drink. She looked around and she knew that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans there in John 4, 9. And she wondered, and Jesus even spoke to her. He said, if you knew who it, were, who it was who was asking you to give him a drink, you would ask me and I would give you living water. A well was water, but they came up from the ground from a spring, but it wasn't living water. Living water was water that flowed like in a brook or a stream or a river. It was moving water, and it was considered the best because the filtration of that water was wonderful. Understand, Jesus offers her living water. And of course, Jesus goes on there in John 4, 13 and 14. He says that if anyone comes to this well and drinks, that they will thirst again. He says, but if anyone drinks of the water of life that I give, they will never thirst again. See, Jesus makes it abundantly clear he's not talking about H2O. He's not talking about that compound or that substance of water that we drink because our bodies desire it, need it. But Jesus is talking about something that restores and sustains and fulfills the very purpose and meaning of life. As Jesus has this conversation with the woman, he then says to her, he says, why don't you go and call your husband? Oh, Jesus strikes a chord. In fact, he hits a wound, a deep wound, because she has had five husbands, and the man that she's living with now is not even her husband. And Jesus points this out, and you can feel the pain come out from this woman because she begins then talking about God and, and worshiping God. She longs for a relationship with him. But there's something missing. If you have your Bibles, look in John chapter 4. Just look at a couple of verses there. As there the woman leaves Jesus, and in verse 25, Jesus has confessed to her that he is the Messiah. He says, I am he. The one that she says that they were looking for is the one that Jesus claims to be. And then in verse 29, the woman goes into the city. And there's this woman with all of her deep emptiness, her life shattered by the pain of broken relationships, by the emptiness of rejection. Here is what she tells the people in Samaria. Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Well, the people are intrigued, and they're interested enough, so they go out to see Jesus, and they have their own meeting with Jesus, and Jesus speaks to them. Look down at verse 42. As they return, and they relate what they have found to the woman who had spoken with Jesus at the well, the woman whose life was certainly considered empty by herself and others around her. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. There are a lot of people in this world with empty lives that we have the opportunity to speak to them, that we can show them who Christ is. Oh, it's not a matter that we can force them to drink the water that give life. We cannot twist someone's arm and force them or compel them to become a Christian. But we can allow them to hear the soul-saving message of Jesus. It is the filling of one's life when one finds that hunger and thirst for God. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. There is something within each person 
that if they recognize that emptiness, there must be a longing. There must be a craving. And, and you and I cannot control, you and I cannot, in our own way, create that craving. We can offer it. We can use the salt of the gospel. We can use the salt of our lives, having been filled and blessed by God, to be able to help create that thirst. But ultimately, every individual is responsible for hungering and thirsting after the righteousness that is from God so that they can have the satisfaction of being filled. Have you ever felt hunger? Have you ever been hungry? Some of you may be like me. I know at least a couple of the guys are, that you're hungry every few hours. Okay? And it doesn't have to be too many hours after you've had a meal that you're starting to feel hungry again. I begin eating in the morning, and I can just kind of keep eating all day. Why is it that all of a sudden after I said that, I feel like I need to stay behind the podium? Okay. All right. Understand, hunger is a natural craving. It's a natural desire. Jesus speaks to this hungering and thirsting after righteousness, knowing that every one of us has had some craving, some hunger for food as sustenance in our lives. Now, let me ask you a question. When you're hungry and you're in a hurry, and so all of a sudden you're driving down the road and you see those very famous golden arches, and you say, you know what, I can just swing in here, go through the drive through and in a matter of moments, have a Big Mac, have a large fry, you know, there, and, and what does that do? If you get that Big Mac or Quarter Pounder, and again, I'm not trying to advertise for McDonald's. That, that's not my point. If you eat that, does that, at least for the time being, satisfy your craving? You say, well, I, I'm not hungry for right now. That's going to tide me over, or that'll get me to the next meal, the next time when I'm supposed to be able to sit down and, and eat something, and, and I'll eat a little healthier then. How many of y'all, I, I shouldn't do this, but how many of y'all immediately say, I'm going to eat healthy the next meal? Okay, all right. How many of y'all say, I'm going right back to McDonald's as often as possible? You know, understand something that you're thinking, okay, I'll do something a little better the next time, but for right now, the craving is that. Understand that the world has its well. The world offers what, what seems to be satisfying. The world offers money. The world offers fame and prestige and power and pleasure. And all of those things, when we drink from that, from the well that the world offers. It seems to satisfy for a moment. But it's not for long. And it isn't healthy. And it isn't the place where God wants us to be able to be truly satisfied. But when we are hungering and thirsting and we don't know what, we haven't identified that our true need, our deepest need, our deepest desire is to know God and to have a relationship with Him, then we go to the first fast food place so to speak, to satisfy the soul, and the soul is not satisfied. You remember what Solomon said? Solomon tried it all. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon sought, tried wisdom. Solomon sought, tried work. Solomon tried wine. Solomon tried women. Solomon tried everything under the sun, and he said, all is vanity and a grasping for the wind. Vanity. When he gets down to the end, he says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. For the duty of man, the whole duty, is to fear God and keep his commandments. In other words, it is in that relationship with God that we find what we were made for. Anything else is only the fast food of life. There are things that we must crave. and You have the power to see. You have the power to understand the way in which God has created you. You have your Bibles there in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. What Paul says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. In other words, this is what you were looking for. Live in him. Take the fullness of life in Christ. He says in verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. As you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Understand that Christianity is a taught religion. It is something that we learn. It is something that we hear. It is something that we absorb, we think about, 
we meditate on, but it is a choice. It is a power to choose. In Romans chapter 3, Paul, trying to prove the very thing that we're talking about, he says in chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. He comes down to verse 23, he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, that's not what you were made for. That's not living up to your potential. That's not being able to see the fullness of what God intended. And then, in Romans 3, look with me in verses 24 to 26. Speaking of what God did to be able to fill your life. He said, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. His righteousness. We had lost our righteousness by sin. We had separated ourselves from God by sin. And that separation meant that there was a void, and God wants to fill that void, and he sent Jesus, not for Jesus to be the forgotten son, but the only begotten, the one who is full of grace and truth, the one who can fill our lives with God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It's what many of us were taught to, to remember, a, a little, little alliteration there of, of the acrostic of the letters of the word grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. What that means is that his righteousness allows us to be made right with God, to be justified, to be reconciled, to be redeemed, regenerated, to have the remission or forgiveness of our sins. Hungering and thirsting after Christ. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness is what we are to choose. Someone has said, you make your choices, and then your choices make your life. Someone else has said that everybody ends up somewhere in life. A few end up somewhere on purpose. You see, understanding who Jesus is allows us to end up somewhere on purpose. Not just living life like an accident, like it's all by chance, but allowing life to be filled with the fullness that can only come from Jesus Christ. I want you to imagine with me an, an older Christian and a young person walking down the seashore. And I say imagine because when I tell you this story, you probably, it would not be the same if I told you it happened in real life. You'll understand in a moment. The older gentleman and the young man are walking along the seashore, and the young man looks at the wiser man and says, how is it that you have the, the secret of a full life in Jesus Christ? How is it? The older man leads the young man out into the water and takes, takes the young man and places him under the surface and holds him there. Holds him down beneath the water for a period of time until finally the young man is thrashing about, craving something that he cannot find below the surface under the water. And the older man lets him back up. And the young man is gasping for air, just grabbing for all the air. And probably some of you have a little bit of phobia and you're probably thinking, you know, that that's a little, little too much. That's why I said imagine this. Don't, don't think it happened in real life. But then the older man looked at him. He said, when you desire a relationship with God as much as you desire that next breath, then you will find it. You see, the power to choose is wanting God. It is hungering and thirsting after righteousness. It is craving that one thing that knowing that that relationship with God is everything. Earlier, I said that there might even be some here, here this morning, and I know that you came here to worship, but it is possible for some of you to be sitting here and not have that craving, not have that hunger and that thirst for righteousness. And so you look at Christianity and you say, well, I see that it has some positive effect but because you don't have that sense of purpose, because you haven't found that passion in your Christianity, you still look at it in some ways as being superficial. 
in some ways is kind of being like a band-aid on a, a wound rather than the true healing power of reaching down and from within you filling your life with all that God wants. Look here in Colossians 2, verses 8 and 9. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. You see, Jesus came into the world full of grace and truth, and in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. In Him is everything that you and I should desire, everything that can give us suffering. The question is, are we thinking? Are we focusing on Him the way God wants us to? Is our life pursuing the relationship with God in Jesus Christ? Are we looking to Him as our example, as our master? listening to him as our Lord in all of our lives. In Luke chapter 19, there was a story of a man. He was a rich man. Jesus was passing through the city of Jericho, and this man was short. Okay, When I say short, I mean he was real short. So he couldn't see over the crowd, and he wanted to get a look at Jesus. So he ran to a tree. He ran. That's, that's significant for a Jewish man to run. It meant that there had to be something really important. And he climbed up into a sycamore tree. All right? Some of you are probably recognizing this story now. He climbs up in the sycamore tree because he wanted to see Jesus. And as Jesus passed that way, Jesus stopped at the base, at the, the root of this tree. And he looked up in there. And he told this man, this rich tax collector, Zacchaeus, he said, you come down, I'm going to your house. Today. I'm sure Zacchaeus was probably thinking, I didn't even get the roast and the potatoes on yet. No, Zacchaeus came down, and others were offended by this, and Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this man's house because he, too, is the son of Abraham. And then Jesus says something in Luke chapter 9, and verse 19, and verse 10, that we can't miss. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. See, if I hunger and thirst after Jesus, I have the power to choose the direction of my life. And if I seek that purpose, then I too am going to do like Zacchaeus. I'm going to want to see Jesus. You see, I look at that story, both Jesus and Zacchaeus both knew what they wanted. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, and Jesus wanted to be, in time, Zacchaeus. And it was because Jesus was seeking, saving. And you and I, we can fill our lives with all kinds of other things and all kinds of activities, but unless we're seeking to save the lost by telling them about Jesus, we're not going to have that full. Our lives are not going to be filled with all that God wants us to have because that's what God has made us. Is if we find that satisfaction, if we find that true bread of heaven, if we drink from the living waters, we're going to share it with someone else. God did not create you so selfish as to say, I've got mine, you figure out your own. No. God wants us to give. It's one beggar telling another beggar where they have found bread. It's being able to share the beauty of the gospel by knowing. But we have, have our mind on right. That we're being filled with the thoughts, the good thoughts, that come by recognizing what we needed, what God provided by recognizing what others need, and by being able to help them find what they need. Time is so precious. Have you realized how precious your life is? The other day I, I put on a, a sweatshirt that my mom had given me when, when I turned 50, and it had the number of days that I had lived for 50 years. You can take your calculator and figure that out for yourself, but understand that I got to thinking about it as I was getting ready for another birthday next month, and it's still a month away, so we're not really worried about it. But I was thinking about, you know, I wonder, with the number of days that was on that sweatshirt, when I'm going to reach my 20,000th day of life. I, I know every one of you probably has wondered the same question. Well, I got my calculator out, and I immediately figured out that it's next year, October 3rd. All right? So I'm not even going to worry about my, my annual birthday in January. I'm going to worry about my 20,000th day birthday 
in October. Okay. So for those of you that were born in October, I just jumped over, I moved my birthday from January to October this year, uh, this one year. Think about it. time. How precious is one year? Ask the student who failed and had to repeat a grade. How precious is one month? Ask the mother who gives birth to a child prematurely with that one month lack of development. How important is one hour? Ask the businessman whose flight was delayed and he missed his important business meeting. How important is one minute? Ask the, the person there in a restaurant who all of a sudden started choking and an EMT was there to be able to help them be revived. How important is one second? Ask the person who just had a near miss of a collision because they barely escaped by a second. How important is one millisecond? Ask the competitor in a race who lost by just a portion of a second. You see, time is relative. But for every one of us, we only have so much time. And the question is, what are you and I investing our time in? We can't save time in a bottle, despite what Jim Croce saying about saving that time so that he could spend eternity with the one he loved. Let me tell you something. The way that you get the most eternal value out of your time is invest that in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then you'll have eternity. Not because you tried to hold on to time in a bottle, but because God has blessed you. This past week on Wednesday night when we were studying the history of Israel, we looked at Ezekiel 37, and there's an a interesting vision in Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, that Ezekiel has of a valley with bones, dry bones. And as he looks at that valley of dry bones, he is confronted with the question, can these bones live? And all of a sudden, Ezekiel starts hearing some rapping. There's some bones clanking around, and all of a sudden, there's some some sinews, that is the soft tissue that connects the bones, and these bones start coming back together with that soft tissue, and then there's skin on top of these bones. And then, the question again, can these bones live? And all of a sudden there's a wind, there's a breath that comes into those bodies. Now, the bones covered with skin. And all of a sudden, they're alive again. Because it is by the power of God that life has come. And part of that vision for Ezekiel was that the nation of, of Israel would again live, that they'd be able to go back home to Jerusalem, but there was something more. In the rest of the chapter that Ezekiel has there, a further vision of two sticks that become united, it shows the promise of the shepherd. It shows the promise of a king like David who would come and unite the people as one again. And just like the Gentiles and the Jews can be united in Christ, everyone can come from that death, those dry bones, back to life. A spiritual fullness because of what God has offered, because of God wanting to give to you today. If you have never known that kind of fullness. If you don't realize what Paul says there in Colossians 2.10, you are complete. Today, recognize that your fullness can only come through Jesus Christ. And if you've never obeyed the gospel, we implore you, we encourage you to crave that righteousness that can only be found in Jesus Christ. For he made him who, who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you want to be in Christ, you need to be born again. As Jesus said in John 3, 5, unless you are born of the water and of the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you want the fullness, be born again today. Be baptized into Christ. Be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll be raised up from that burial there in the water to walk in newness of life. Your life full, having received Jesus Christ as Savior. If there is someone here today that as a Christian, you realize that what you've been missing is you haven't had the, the hunger and thirst for Christ. You haven't been craving to allow your life to be filled by him. I want you to renew your if we can encourage you in any way, step down to the front. We'll be glad to assist you right now while we stand and while we sing.